Got it. Thank you. Ooh, okay. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> okay, so tonight I am really honored to introduce to everyone our new state agriculturist, Annie Mills, who is replacing Joan Mahoney as Joan is retiring. Um, so we briefly met at the, uh, which was it, the conference no, for- we saw the Yeah, summer. at Saba, <laughs> yeah, over the winter when we had that beautiful snowstorm that some of us couldn't make, but a bunch of us did. One of the last. Yes, the yeah, yeah, and it was, yeah, one of the last storms, but, uh, but it was really nice, really well attended in spite of the weather and whatever, so yeah, so we briefly got to meet, and, uh, but she was really kind to come down today in spite of your busy schedule and everything like that, so we do uh, really appreciate that, and um, so, uh, so, so she is part of the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, Division of Plant Industry, and tonight's topic is on uh, pest management, which we all want to know about because those nasty little pests are driving us crazy, so without further ado, everyone please give a big hand to Anna. I'm going to use the microphone. I'm a little bit quiet, so got to get used to this. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. When Marian extended the invitation to me, I was pretty excited about joining you tonight. I grew up not too far from here. I'm originally from Cobleskill, New York, so um, always happy to come back into the area and uh, and. <laughs> And since I am new, I should probably tell you a little bit about myself. I don't really love doing that in front of a big group, but <laughs> since I'm new, I'll do it. Um, my background really is in uh, fruit, fruit and vegetable pest management. I pursued an entomology degree for my master's degree at the University of Florida. And that's where I ended up getting involved with bees and getting into bees. Um, always been interested in pollination and, um, and work for Cornell Cooperative Extension and North Carolina State Extension um, for a, the past seven years or so. But I'm so happy to be here. And again, thank you for having me. Okay, and also since I have a captive audience here, I'm gonna throw in a little bit of information uh, about the, the Department of Agriculture in New York State and uh, what we do. So the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets real role is to protect the food supply of uh, New York State and also help protect our agricultural industry here. The apiary inspection program falls under the uh, uh, plant industry division. So if you go to our website, that's where you'll find our honeybee help page. And in New York, we have thousands of bee colonies that are used for pollination services of over $300 million of crops each year. Um, New York is home to over 60,000 honeybee colonies. So this is an important industry in New York. Um, the apiary inspection program inspects colonies and we monitor their movement as uh, beekeep, commercial beekeepers come into the state and then exit the state depending on where they're going and what the state regulations are, where they're headed. Uh, we have a couple different types of inspections, and if you would like to get in touch with one of your regional apiary inspectors, I'm happy to do that. I can put you in touch. Um, our year starts off with queen and nuke sale inspections for the, the most part. Um, if you're selling queens or nukes in New York State, it uh, is required for you to have an inspection. Uh, the inspectors are kind of moving into our general inspections now. We also are participating in the National Honeybee Survey. Um, so our inspectors are taking samples for uh, commercial beekeepers and sending them into the National Honeybee Survey, which uh, helps the USDA get a, an overall 
sense of honeybee health um, as a baseline across the country. And then of course, we'll talk about American fowl brood here. Um, here is the regional map for our state inspectors. Um, so we're in Brian English's territory. Some of you I'm sure have met him before. A uh, great inspector. Uh, really, really hard worker. I'm, I'm happy to work with Ryan. And if, um, if you'd like to get in touch with your regional inspector again, just let me know. So here's just a quick example of our uh, part of our inspection sheet here. Um, and again, the inspections are only mandatory if you're selling queens and nukes. Um, and if you're moving, if you're bringing equipment and bees into so last year we had um, 162 queen and nuke sales certificates issued here. And then we certified 5,000 nukes, over 5,000 nukes, um, 29,000 queens in New York were certified, and uh, 90 colonies, um, full production colonies were certified in the state. Um, the state laws regarding bee diseases, which we'll talk about today, um, can be found online. Uh, they can be found at this uh, New York State Open Legislation website here. And we'll, we'll cover some of the laws uh, a little bit more here with American Fowl Brood. Okay, now we're getting to the, the meat of the presentation here, uh, why most of you are here, like Marianne said, to deal with those pesky insects and <laughs> diseases that you may have in your hive. Um, so most of us don't get into beekeeping because we want to deal with those types of things. But um, if you do get into beekeeping, you're likely an innovative type of person. Um, personally, I like the idea of integrated pest management because one of the advantages of it is that you are supposed to be able to save money from using this particular strategy. I don't know if that particular um, outcome exists in beekeeping as a whole. It's, it's very hard to do <laughs> with this particular hobby, but um, integrated pest management is essentially, you're using a variety of different types of tools and strategies to manage the pests in your colony. Um, the the trade-offs to not using pesticide management would be, um, for example, uh, depending on calendar schedules or adding burrow treatments to your hive, um, this type of thing can uh, contribute to um, pest resistance and so IPM is again the use of multiple strategies focusing on cultural controls, physical controls, um, mechanical controls, and also focusing on biological and chemical controls. So at the bottom of our pyramid here, we're focusing on things that we're doing to try to disrupt the environment of the pests that we're dealing with. For an example of a cultural control might be to try to place your hives in the full sun, um, or using small hive, um, placing them in full sun for small hive beetle um, control, or using resistant stock or varroa. Physical controls are anything that exploit the um, physical limitations of the pest that you're dealing with. So a physical control measure would be something like freezing your drawn comb to uh, kill wax moth larvae and using and or using ventilation um, to and light for storing your used equipment. And then we have mechanical controls. So something that would be mechanical would be an example of um, smashing your small hive beetles as you find them on the box. <laughs> And we'll talk about ID a little later on. But, um, and then also using something like a screen bottom board. Okay, now we're getting up into the top of our triangle here. So 
this, these strategies are a little bit either harder to use or they are, they're not necessarily preventative measures like the bottom of our, our pyramid here. So when we're talking about biological controls, uh, you may be thinking about something like using a soil treatment to um, apply nematodes that would control small hive beetle as well. Uh, and not, these are just examples, not a, not a huge pest issue in New York, but they are there, we all see them. <laughs> um, and then lastly at the tip, um, I would equate this to, you know, on the food pyramid, you're thinking about the sugar and sweets at the top of your food pyramid. You only want to use this a little bit every now and then if you can. So chemical controls, you can use either um, organic or synthetic chemical controls. Um, and we will talk about that when we get to the Varroa section here. So here's a, a couple of things. And you see these types of recommendations on a lot of beekeeping or just like anything you're looking at with gardening, you're seeing like these general recommendations for keeping pests and diseases out and it makes everything sound really easy. Like if you just do these few bullet points, you'll be good, right? We all know it's not that easy, but these are preventative measures to try our best to do and make sure that we're, we're at least doing these at the bare minimum here. And it's not so easy. Um, yeah, everybody's always looking for a better location um, to, to place things. And, and as I said, money is a, a limiting factor as well, oftentimes. So uh, now we're gonna get into some diseases here. Um, when you're looking for, when you're doing hive inspections, you want to always be looking for that nice, healthy, uh, pearly white brood. If you know what healthy is, you'll know <laughs> what unhealthy is very easily um, mm -hmm. during your inspections. And we're gonna start off with brood diseases here. So anytime you're seeing something that's not that pearly white color, you want to, you're gonna have a red flag raised. Um, so here are a couple brood diseases you know, you would see or or you may have seen already. Do folks recognize these already? These are like you don't have to admit that you have them. <laughs> yeah, have you seen them anywhere in anyone anyone's apiary ever? <laughs> That's what I. <laughs> Okay, I'm just trying to get a sense of the, the room here <laughs> and uh, get a sense of what folks have seen before. So European fowl brood in New York, it's it's fairly, I don't wanna say common, it's here, it's, it's something that we have to contend with, uh, our beekeepers have to contend with. Uh, this is considered a stress disease. It can cause considerable losses in colonies. Um, most of the research and education um, publications that you see say that this uh, brood disease, it clears up with a nectar flow, uh, but the spores from this bacteria do persist in the colony, not quite as long as something like American fowl brood, but it's, it can be challenging to get rid of um, in your colonies. Uh, you can deal with it or um, any of these brood diseases really by sanitation, replacing holes, um, getting, taking out things that are infected, removing that um, reservoir from your, from your colonies. Um, our next one is chalk brood. This is a fungal disease that you'll see uh, from time to time. And it often happens when nurse bees can't keep the larvae warm. And this is, one is really unique. I didn't put a picture of the little chalk brood mummies here, but you'll see the, the pupae coming out of the cells and they're just exactly like the description of this disease. They're a chalky little tight 
kind of mummy and uh, bees will remove them from cells and, and kick them out onto the, the hive entrance. Um, you can also, similar with Europe, European fowl brood, you can overcome this by removal of um, some of that those fungal spores from your, uh, by taking frames physically out and, and cycling new ones in. Um, you can somewhat combat it by providing a, a drier area as well. And then our, our last one is sac brood here. This is a fungal disease and it's, you can see how, again, these, these descriptions of the, the particular disease are spot on. It's just when the, the larvae is like this jelly filled uh, sac, you can pull a whole thing out of a, of a cell. And this disease also can be uh, managed. And I say managed, not necessarily cured, but it can be managed by um, again, cycling out frames, um, reducing that reservoir of spores that are in the colony. And, and these three, you know, they're, they're, it goes back to the, the basic things that we want to do to provide our colonies with a, a sunny location, keep things dry, sanitize, and so forth. But um, often these particular uh, diseases, they can um, clear up with good nutrition and, and good physical environments for your colonies. Now on to American fowl brood. So this is a regulated disease in New York. It's what the state apiary program spends the most time on. It's really kind of why we're here. Um, American fowl brood is a disease where that does not have a cure. And it's a bacterial disease that has four forming bacteria that will uh, infect brood. And adult bees don't have it, but they feed, uh, as they're feeding young larvae, they transfer it to, they can transfer spores to the larvae. And larvae will then uh, turn this kind of coffee color, as you can see in the cells. Again, see, it's very different than that nice pearly white larvae from the first pictures there. So they'll turn this kind of coffee colored and then end up lying very flat on the southern rim of the cell. Um, a strong or a weak colony can get this. It's not necessary. It doesn't depend on how strong your colony is. The American fowl brood spores are something that exists in our environment, but it's the amount of spores that your bees or the larvae are exposed to that can end up causing an infection. These particular spores also can last uh, uh, over 70 years in the environment. Here's some diagnostic tools for American fowl brood. Hopefully no one's ever seen this or had to deal with it. Um, if you have, I'm very sorry. Uh, it's, it's a really challenging disease. Uh, one of the diagnostic characteristics you'll often see is this roping of the larvae. If you do a, a toothpick test into that dark coffee colored larvae, it should rope out if it's infected with American fowl brood. And that's caused by the, the spores or bacteria that um, this disease comes from. And then another diagnostic characteristic is this uh, sunken uh, cell cappings as well. And sometimes they'll be oozing a little bit and somewhat greasy. And then the last pictures, there are more progressed versions of the disease. And this is an American fowl brood infected frame that's been irradiated two times to make the spores, um, well, to kill the spores. <laughs> and I'm happy to show folks if they want to come up and take a look at it afterwards. And in the frame, you can see 
you can see the scales on the southern rim of the cell here. I won't take it out just yet. But you can see the scales that form at the most progressed uh, version of this disease. And those scales are very hard. It's something that the bees cannot remove from the cell. And it's tough to see. You really, it helps to have a nice sunny day so you can look at the bottom of your cells. So to test for this, um, in the past, have folks heard of the, those Vita test kit before for European fowl brood? And, um, the Vita test kits are not the, a quick way to test for either European fowl brood or American fowl brood. They're not commercially available as of this year. Um, there is another way that you can do a quick in the field test, however, for American fowl brood. And it's called the Holst milk test. This test just requires a little bit of powdered milk, uh, water, and two test tubes. So what you'll be doing, ultimate, I should have switched these slides around. What you'll be doing is creating two, I'll go back to it. You'll be creating two test tubes. And both of them have a little bit of powdered milk, a little bit of water in them. And you just want them both to have that milky color. You're going to set one of those test tubes aside as your control. The other one, you'll add some suspect larvae to it. And try not to choose the most, like, you know, the darkest looking samples because this can kind of alter the test a little bit. But you add some, some suspect larvae to the second tube, and you'll place both those tubes in a warm area. You can just put them in like a breast pocket or put them on a sunny windowsill, and you'll want to agitate them a little bit. Um, and after about 15 to 20 minutes, you'll see some kind of change with those tubes. And what's happening is that the spores from the American fowl brood are reacting with the enzymes in the milk. So you should have, they, they call it a change. They don't say <laughs> it's supposed to look a certain way necessarily or be a certain color, but um, if American fowl brood spores are present in, one of, in the sample that you put that infected larvae in, um, there's an enzymatic reaction and you get that clear um, test tube color there. So it's breaking down the, the enzymes in the milk. So how do we avoid how do we avoid these spores in our own colonies? And looking at this list of things, it kind of bums me out. It, kind of feels like it takes a lot of the fun out of everything. <laughs> so I'm sorry. It's, it's like a little, it's a bit disheartening. Um, this is a fairly rare disease. It's for a good reason. We, we work to make sure that the levels in New York are low for this, but um, you can prevent it by being very careful about um, using or buying used equipment. We can't, inspectors can do um, an inspection of used equipment if you'd like to sell something. Um, it's hard to inspect, you know, an empty box, but we can also walk you through some things about um, sanitizing the, the inside and burning uh, the in, inside. So AFP can spread in a, a multitude of ways. And it really, it's, it's um, scary to think about all the ways that it can spread. And you really should inspect your hive specifically for this about three times a year. That's a general recommendation. I'm looking for it every single time I look at my bees. I probably don't need to be necessarily. But um, here are some general recommendations for cleaning your, your tools. Um, AFP spores can be killed by heat. They can't really be killed by disinfectants, soapy water, alcohol, and so forth. 
Um, with those types of things, what you're more doing is removing them physically from the tools that you're using. So um, after hive inspections, you want to scrape all the propolis off of your hive tool and uh, smoker when you're going between APIs. You also want to consider possibly having a separate hive tool and smoker in each yard if you can. Um, if you use leather gloves, they're not so expensive that you couldn't possibly get a pair for each yard, but um, most folks use the nitrile gloves so you can just dispose of them after uh, working your apiary. And then again, keep isopropyl alcohol with you. This will help remove spores um, from your equipment or from your, your tools per se, but it's not necessarily killing any spores of your foul brood. So there are also recommendations for bringing new bees into your yard. Uh, some folks will say, you know, if they're going to get new bees, a package is, it tends to be less of a risk for introduction of a disease like this because there's no comb in there. So what you can do if you're getting a package is um, install that into a colony that's physically separated from the rest of your apiary. Wait till you see some of that brood developing in there and see if it looks really healthy and if, if um, there's anything wrong, if there's nothing wrong with it, then uh, you can safely move it into the rest of your apiary or colony. So when you're, this is another tool that we use. I'm sure some of you have them. <laughs> it's really awesome to have one of these. <laughs> so this will, that um, AFB spores are, killed at about 266 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this goes over a thousand, like 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a great tool to have, um, not only for convenience, but also peace of mind when you're cleaning your, your hive tool or, or smoker and so forth. It's also really fun and <laughs> <laughs> makes quick work of lighting your smoker. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm going to show you guys how to do an inspection for American Fowl Brew quickly here. So again, you want to try to do this three times a season. And you want to always try to look for three frames of brood, inspect three frames of brood in your colony. Um, I'm not going to pass this around. This is very precious to us. <laughs> but <laughs> when you're inspecting for AFB, you're looking at the southern rim of the cell, and they say to put this, have the sun at your back. So I'm going to face the window like this. So you can see with some light coming into the southern rim of the cell here and check for those scales in there. And it's hard to see, but also you'll see how this, this particular frame is really, it's just nasty looking. It's black and then there's a lot of chewed cappings on there. Some chewing is happening for other reasons in your colonies, like the varroa removal or um, hygienic behavior. With the AFB <coughs> chewing, it tends to be more like in the, the side of each of the cells, but that's not necessarily a, a unique characteristic for ID but that is something to look for um, along with the shot hole brood pattern and also like the name implies there's a smell to the disease. So um, some people are more sensitive to it, but it has a very foul um, kind of like fishy odor to it. And you can smell this frame. <laughs> it smells not always, or it's not usually recommended as a diagnostic tool alone, but it's one of the tools that 
we can use. <coughs> So in 2023, there were um, only 16 cases of this in New York State. Green County wasn't one of them, so let's keep it that way. <laughs> um, and here's our map, which uh, we update on the website if you're ever curious to see where the particular <laughs> disease is. And uh, for this year, it's on that Honeybee Health page. For this year, we have had two findings so far. Um, the two findings were just one colony in each location. And those colonies have been abated. Um, the colonies do need to be either burned or buried. Um, with AFB, if a colony is found, if you suspect it, please do report it to us. There's, um, I'm stealing this phrase from someone else, but um, there's no shame in having this particular disease. It's really, it's how you deal with it that can be a problem because it's so contagious and because it can spread to other apiaries and other beekeepers so uh, readily. So it, it is the law to report this particular disease. And if it if uh, you suspect it, we'll have an inspector come visit and they'll send a sample to the Beltsville Bee Lab. If there is a positive, um, at that point, that's when the abatement happens and um, the colony needs to be eradicated. To answer any questions about that before we go on to the 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 less depressing <laughs> test that we have. Yes. Um, yes. Um, yes. Um, Yes, that's a good question. And I'll, I'll repeat it for everybody or summarize. Um, the question was a, about being able to save adult bees if um, AFB is found in your colony or a yard. Um, and there's two answers to it. So it's yes and no. The colony that tests positive, that has to be abated and destroyed. But it's only that colony that tests positive. If all the others are, are looking good and healthy, then um, those bees, you can move them into new equipment and, and help reduce the risk of spread. Uh, you can also do, by doing a, a shook swarm method, shaking them into new equipment. And the inspectors we do, well, the, uh, with the inspector program, we do follow up. So if there um, is a positive case one year, then we're coming back to inspect again, just to ensure that it hasn't spread and, and, and help look for them. So it's a, a yes and no to that question. Yep. If you have multiple colonies, the likelihood that it will spread to uh, um, prevent it, just like physically separating because it can be spread through drift. Or, uh, you, can, you can reduce incidences of robbing by if as much as possible that can help with eliminating or preventing spread. You can physically separate your colonies by uh, probably a longer distance than you really want to walk between them. Um, you can also make the colonies look very physically different from each other to try to prevent uh, drifting as well. But I'm sorry, I don't, I can try to follow up on that. I don't have a, like a number percentage for likelihood. It's fair, I would say fairly likely just because of the, the behaviors of bees, like I mentioned. Oh no. <laughs> okay. 
This is good. No. There was um, there was a presentation like a Zoom call from six to the BLAB uh, built and built and Mark. Yep. AMC is the highest diversity than anywhere else. New York, I can yes, I can answer that question. New York appears to be the highest because. In other states, it's not mandatory to report oh. not necessarily. In in New York, we're only we're only sending tests that we know are positive. Other states also don't necessarily. They may do an in field test, or they may do just a visual inspection and say and identify the disease, and then it's erratic. to always send positive results well, and that's why yeah, that's why it, our numbers appear higher. It's not as bad as it I hope uh, makes me feel better. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We're only sending. We're, we're only sending. Other states. More. Yep. In in the other you can't for AFP. Can treat the rest of your antibiotics mm -hmm. or recommending it. You have a. With antibiotics, yeah, but it will still be. We'll send an inspector right away and we'll do it in field. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. So this, yes, this is unique to American foul brood. Other diseases do not do this. European foul brood might do it a tiny bit, but AFB really. Um, it's the infected larvae will stretch out like this. And the analogy some people use is that it's like a little mucus booger from a little <laughs> kid. So you've got that mucus booger coming out with the infected larvae. That's when you know that um, you've got a problem. What happens to the honey on an infected hive? Does that get abated? The honey, yes, yeah. The spores can be in the honey, and if other bees feed on that, um, they can get the the disease. This is okay. interesting. One more. I'm so sorry. There's, um, there are 
scenes now that are being used as we yes. are seeing something that is going to progress to be either like required or like standard. I'm hopeful that it can help. I I have to look at the research more on it, but I'm hopeful that it can help. I don't know if it's something that would ever necessarily be required. I can't speak to that. Um, but I mean, we we know with Varroa too, having um, resistant stock, it's it's a, a tool in our IPM toolbox that can be used for a lot of these different diseases. So I'm hopeful that that can be one of the tools that we use to manage the disease. I'm gonna move on to, we've been going an hour already. Is it, no, no, we started, not an hour, okay. No, we started the presentation before. <laughs> okay. You're good. Okay, all right. You can be the judge on if the next topic is more fun or not oh, than the sorry. last one. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. This is probably why most of you came here tonight. <laughs> so we have to talk about this too. Um, and most beekeepers would say Varroa is their number one enemy and and not at all the reason that you get into beekeeping, but it's something that we also have to deal with. Um, so Varroa mites are a, a parasite that will uh, feed on the fat body of bees and it weakens them, it weakens their immune system, makes them more susceptible to some of those other diseases we saw. And um, these Varroa mites also can transmit viruses like deformed wing virus, which is the uh, most prevalent one that you'll see. The Varroa, as we know, um, it contributes to a lot of colony losses. So for every adult mite, there are three more that are on the way in the form of daughter mites. And we wanna start monitoring in spring. Has everyone done a Varroa test? Yeah, or raise your hand if you've never done one before. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> so we'll talk about testing. If you do have bees, you um, want to test for Varroa at this point. Um, and you also definitely want to be testing when it comes August, because this is the time that winter bees are being produced that are gonna help your colony. Um, get through winter, we hope. So identifying Varroa can be tricky. They're very sneaky. We don't always see them on the bees, but they're there. Uh, the only way to really know if they're there is by sampling. And um, by the time you're seeing other physical symptoms in the brood or on adult bees, it's likely fairly late in the game for infestation of Varroa. So monitoring and sampling is what we use to inform us of what those mite levels are at any given point in time. And sometimes our colonies don't have any varroa, and that's great, but there's only one way to know when that changes, and that's by sampling and monitoring for them. So I lost my other, my other varroa sampling thing to the day's work and it ended up in someone else's car. But <laughs> I have a couple, we can go over um, sampling methods with you today. But essentially you want to uh, monitor Varroa once a month during the production season and, uh, or once every month that you can really open up your hives. But there are two, there's a, a few different methods. These are the two most common ones. The, there are positives and negatives of both. Um, with using a sugar shake method, you're using powdered sugar and you're putting about, a, you're putting a half cup of bees into a jar like this. And then you've got a, a top with some eight gauge mesh. I think you could probably use a, a 
a seven or a nine, but it's <laughs> what they recommend. So we've got an eight gauge mesh there. I put a line on this jar so that I know that the half cup, I don't have to bring another um, item with me to the apiary, but keep your greens in there. And then you're going to take some powdered sugar on your hive tool and dump it into the, the jar over the top here. And you'll be shaking those bees and rolling them for about two minutes or so. And then afterwards, I don't have all my props that I, I could have, but you'll shake out your bees and shake them onto a, a white paper plate or into like a white fish <gasps> basin. And all the, the sugar should come out and some mites will be loosened up by that powdered sugar and shake out as well. And so with alcohol, well, with, with the sugar shake method, this is not always quite as accurate because you have to really, really vigorously shake and get all of the, the mites off with them. So it's, it's not always as accurate. With alcohol wash methods, this is a little bit quicker. You can, you can use the same tool necessarily, but um, they do sell some kits that make it a lot easier to, to monitor Vera with the alcohol wash method. This, um, you're using the same number of bees, a half cup of bees. You can shake them off your frame into that dish pan, scoop them up with a half cup, or um, just use a measuring, a self-made measuring cup like this. But either way, you are measuring 300 bees and then counting the mites that come off those 300 bees. We divide that by three and um, multiply by 100 to get your percentage. And that gives us the threshold. threshold for varroa monitoring by a 2% infestation rate or threshold is what we use to tell us when uh, time to treat varroa and that's two mites per 100 bees so multiply two by three and that means you're getting uh, six mites for that whole sample that you got so we're doing math at night <laughs> um, and then in August and October, the threshold is a little bit higher, and that's for kind of an interesting reason. The threshold is a little bit higher at this time because as there's less brood um, near the, the fall, then at this time the, the mites are moving off of the brood and they're um, they're more easily shaken off of bees. So there's a slightly higher threshold from August to October. Okay. And now some, some nitty gritty stuff on choosing treatments. Uh, there's really no one size fits all recommendation for treatments. You'll develop um, a preference and as you learn, you'll develop a preference for, you know, how you want to deal with Varroa and if you're using chemical treatments, which products work best for you in terms of how, it, you know, how easy they are to apply and so forth, your price or how effective they are in your particular apiary. But the most important thing to remember here is to rotate the active ingredients of any pesticide treatments that you do put in your hive. Or that uh, is a lot of pesticide you're applying. So uh, do not apply things uh, mixed together. Do not apply things that are, are not labeled um, as they're specifically registered with a specific dosage that's intended to safely address the, the issue that these products are developed for. So one of my preferred resources at the moment for Varroa management information is this ABB Health Coalition website here. And they have a whole guide on Varroa management 
and there are videos, there are charts, they put all the information together for you. And I really can't recommend this resource enough for Varroa management. Again, that's the Honeybee Health Coalition website. And as if you know a little bit about rural management, you'll know that there are all sorts of different caveats for when certain treatments can be applied, such as how hot it is outside, or if you have honey supers on and so forth. So this particular guide puts all of that information together and summarizes it for you. Um, but right now we're into the population increasing phase for the year. So, um, these are some of the recommendations. And because we have capped brood at this time of year, uh, uh, Formic Pro is one of the recommended pesticides for this time of year. But you can also use Apovar, uh, Apogard, Apovar, Life Bar. And at this time of year, um, There are some moderately effective options as well on um, requeening or using hygienic stock. It still can be moderately effective at this time of year. And then I'm gonna go into our, our population peak. Um, so come August, uh, September, that's our population peak. It'll be here before we know it. So these are some of the options that you can use. And again, it's really, a, it's gonna be a preference as to what you decide that you like to use in your apiary. Um, you may not need to treat this first year if you have new bees, and hopefully that's the case, but keep up with your monitoring and sampling and um, have a plan ready. So this is similar to when we were talking about the AF, preventing AF, AFB spread. Um, but we're preventing varroa populations increasing in, in all of your hives. You can try to reduce drift by spreading the hives apart. Again, making them look very physically different from one another, um, using resistance stock. And then this last one is really interesting to me, but I'm a little afraid of it. Um, drone brood removal is something that some folks use to limit Varroa in their hives because those um, varroa are going to the drone larvae. Um, this particular method, um, it requires you to remove the frames on a really systematic basis. And personally, I'm afraid that I'm going to miss the date that I have to take them out. So that's why a lot of people avoid it. But it's a it's a great idea if you can really stay on that schedule and get the the mite infested larvae physically out of your hive that can be a way of managing. So again, make a plan um, and it helps to go over all the information and try to make a decision about what you're, you're going to have in your back pocket or the day when you sample and your mites are above threshold. And it's, it's great to have the product or chemical on hand if you need it. Because at the point, if you're, and I'm talking more, if you've never done this before and you're, you're new to varroa management, you've got to make your plan, decide which product you're going to use. And then once you get that above threshold number, you're going to also have to read all the instructions and learn exactly how to apply that product. So the more prepared you can be in advance, the better. And then last thing on uh, the Honeybee Health Coalition website here is a really cool tool. It's called the Varroa Management Decision Tool. It's kind of like a quiz that you can take to um, answer questions about your specific situation. And then it will give you more options and as you go through the quiz. And it tells you about um, some of the ways that you can manage Varroa based on your situation. What's the time? Eight or seven. Yeah, you okay. Can, yeah, eight or seven.
Okay. Real, real quick before we move on, yes. somebody at home, Anthony, uh, has asked when it comes to testing, have you heard of a CO2 method? It yes. doesn't kill the bees. Yes. You can you, you can use CO <laughs> you can use CO2 um, to get the mites off of the bees. It's it's I mean it's something that you can do. I don't know that it's that widely used though. Just because it, I don't know that it's particularly user friendly. Um, and there is some research that's showing that the sugar shake method, although it doesn't kill the bees, it may cause some sublethal effects. To the system. And so it may, the sugar shake method also, even though you're not killing the bees, you may still be kind of, you're weakening them and, and uh, making it harder for them to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not in, in the background. Slowly but surely. Yeah, so I I think the, the alcohol wash method, it's quick, it's accurate, and um, you get the information you're going to need. And then it's also, it's for the good of the whole colony and, you know, all the sisters together. You know, those bees, they have a pretty short lifespan as well. So you're, you're doing something. And taking a small sample that's like less than one percent of your colony to uh, make a decision that's hopefully going to help all of um, all of these there. Okay. So here's uh, our um, our next pest, that pesky little small hive beetle that everybody likes to smash on their frames. <laughs> um, these are. Again, they, they're here. They're usually not a problem in hives when you have a, a strong colony. It can be more of a problem in stored equipment. Um, these beetles, I didn't know this before the presentation, but they can actually fly up to eight miles, which is incredibly far for such a tiny little thing. I don't know how they do that, but um, they can fly up to eight miles. Um, if you're seeing about 12 of these beetles per hive, that's when you might want to think about um, investing in a, a small hive beetle trap. And I think that these little guys move in a really cool and interesting way. They're, they're like very quick and they go up and over and into your cells in, a, in an interesting way. But uh, our next pest after that is a wax moth. And again, this particular insect pest that gets into your honeybee colonies is not typically a problem if the colonies are already strong. Um, you'll notice that this particular pest, when you see some webbing inside the frames and it kind of like in a trail underneath the, the cells of your um, home. And this, again, is more of an issue in stored equipment. You can prevent their infestation or attraction to your equipment by stacking it so that light can shine through onto your frames. I wanted to have one slide at least to talk about how you can submit samples to Beltsville. Has anyone done this before? Okay. So typically, if you are interested in submitting a sample to Beltsville, if you're looking at a brood disease or something you think is a brood disease, try to get a comb sample. Um, that's preferred with the, the brood in there. And then it has to be wrapped in paper, not plastic. It's best to put the sample into a box so it's not getting smushed in the mail. Um, and the sample, you can also have samples for pests like Nosema and Varroa Nosema, we're not gonna talk about today, but um, you can send things like small hive beetles if you're not sure, but those are fairly easy to identify. But here's the address for the Beltsville Bee Lab, and they can analyze the sample for free. Um, 
with the brood diseases, if you can't send a comb sample, try to take a couple swabs with a Q-tip of the infected brood and you'll also wrap that in paper so that it's not drying out or getting moldy from being wrapped in plastic. And we're into some of our last pests here. So mammals can be a problem in apiaries as well. Skunks can be pretty pesky and they dig around the entrance. They can eat a lot of bees. Um, physical barriers are something that you can use to deter these from your apiary. Um, you can place like wire, like sharp wire mesh around the entrance. Mice. Um, these can be a serious problem in store comb um, in fall and winter. I would say to try to go through that. I mean, it depends on the volume you have, but if you're going through it, you're disrupting any habitat that mice might be making in there. And then lastly, bears. Um, if you do have a bear attack your apiary, they're likely to come back. So the best defense you can have is a, a electric fence. And again, we don't get into beekeeping because we want to build things like this, but <laughs> it's, it's better to have it before you need it than, than after a bear has already visited your apiary. Um, there's two good resources for building bear fences. There's a Vermont, um, like, oh, it's on the previous slide, isn't it? Did I put it on there? Yes, Fish and Wildlife Game. <laughs> Thank you. And then also there's a University of Florida research on building a, an electric bear fence for your apiary. But you want to have over 5,000 volts for that fence because bears have long fur. You want to, you need to make sure that the, the voltage can get through to them. So that's the general recommendation on fences. The voltage on your bear fence. Oh. Yep. Leave mute at home. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's it for pests and diseases. Um, here's a, a couple other things that the apiary inspection program does. Um, I mentioned earlier, we participate in the National Honeybee Survey, so the inspectors are sampling um, from commercial beekeeper operations, and they send those samples, well, we send the samples to the USDA to get analyzed for viruses and diseases and get a baseline of what um, issues bees are facing for the country. Um, this year, the apiary inspection program will also be participating in a non-native wasp survey that Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture hosts or arranges, and we'll have three different locations across the state to trap and monitor for any non-native wasps, wasps that may um, or hopefully may not come into the state. And then we have uh, plenty of um, northern giant hornet calls that we get. Uh, the northern giant hornet was formerly known, and I should just let sleeping dogs lie, but the, <laughs> the northern giant hornet was formerly um, a very publicized pest known as the murder hornet. Um, and they are not in New York. The only positive cases are in the northwest corner of Washington state. Um, a new pest of concern is the yellow-legged hornet, and I have a sample in my car, if anyone would like to see it. <laughs> um, I have a sample of that that I can go and, uh, and bring back in. But um, no, no northern giant hornet, no Asian giant hornet in New York state thus far, and hopefully never. The yellow-legged hornet has had several um, positive identifications in Georgia and South Carolina, and they have taken out, I don't know the, the number of nests, a small amount of nests have been found, and 
is destroyed for the yellow-legged hornet. Um, we've got the <coughs> Northeast Apiary Industry Lunch and Learn. I don't have the link for that, but I can follow up with Marianne to send everybody the link so that you have that. Um, the Northeast Apiary Inspectors meet. We've got several dates coming up. Let me see, we've got August 2nd and October 4th, where we have a Zoom and we'll just address some of the beekeeping issues or concerns happening in the region. And it's open for beekeepers to join that if you'd like to, to hop on. And then American Fowl Brood Education, we, we covered that, I think, tonight. And the um, apiary inspection program is also part of the apiary industry advisory committee. So part of the state bee laws require or um, provide the opportunity for us to have apiary industry advisory committee with folks from different industries that sit on this. Um, we have commercial beekeepers, we have folks that participate in pollination services, and um, also representatives from Cornell University that sit on this with the Commissioner of Agriculture and help inform the department of um, important happenings in the industry and, and things of concern to the beekeeping industry or the fruit and vegetable industry with pollination services. Oh, can I mention something about that? Yeah, so I'm yeah. Kind of on that panel. Yes. Yeah. So, can you talk about it? Oh, <laughs> I guess quickly. Yeah, I, guess yeah. really quickly. I yeah. have it. We have a we have a meeting coming up uh, on the June on the twentieth. Actually, 20th. next week, yes. and I won't be able to make it. I'll be out of town. Okay. But I was just um, um, asked if I would sit on that, which I did accept, not knowing what to expect. And recently, um, someone did. Um, Put like a Facebook post. I forgot the gentleman's name, but he was very gracious. And what he publicly did was just reach out to the a beekeeping community and say, listen, if you have any issues or whatever that you'd like for us to bring back, please let us know. Well, of course, there's always those few people. And there was one gentleman that did jump back and, um, and he just kind of jumped on like, oh, it's just politics and blah, blah, blah. So of course, I'm the national, and I jumped in <laughs> and I said, um, I attended the last meeting. It was my first one. I didn't know what to expect, but everyone was gracious. Everyone had a chance to speak if you had something or a concern to address or whatever. And um, but the, my main point is, if there is any concerns or anything that you would like, to address and um, for me to bring back to Agri Markets, let me know at any point. So when we do meet, it's something that we could bring up and discuss because the commissioner is highly interested in what he can do for us as a beekeeping community and to address whether it's the governor or whatever channels to go from. So. It's yep. open. It yeah, is, right? it's open yeah. to the public. Yes. Yeah, and I think that was one of the uh, specifications that yeah. it can't, yeah. What is the date for that? Um, June 20th at one o'clock, and it's at the, at the market. Yes, 10B Airline Drive, Albany. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. You explained that very well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So June 20th will be the Apiary Industry Advisory Committee. And as you probably know, the commissioner um, for the department is not from very far away from here. Well, his, his farm is not from very far away from here. And he is very interested in uh, pollination, anything related to beekeeping or agriculture. He's, he's very, um, I shouldn't promote like this, but he's <laughs> he's a, he's a very uh, a nice gentleman and, and and a great listener. If you if you have issues that you'd like to bring up, he spoke for us once. Yeah, yeah. We had him um, here actually one of the early meetings. Yeah, it's the owner of the carrot farm, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yep. Yeah, he spoke yes. for us. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Richard Ball. See, yeah. he came up. He came here. Yeah. <laughs> 
Also, if you're on our uh, Facebook group, the uh, Catskill Mountain Beekeepers Club group, we already did the lunch and learn. I posted that, so it is in our okay. within my wheelhouse. I know about. Thank it, so. you. <laughs> and Anthony and Thank Angie you. is on the committee. Oh, okay. Yep. Was Anthony. Anthony. Lunch and learn. Yeah, I think Anthony, he was. He that. was. I recognize the name. Yeah, he's yeah. watching you. He's on Zoom. Okay. <laughs> he's making all these comments, and I'll get to later. <laughs> Hi, Anthony. <laughs> I can't wait. Well, he wants to know if you use honey flavor vodka for the alcohol night wash. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't taste it. <laughs> Maybe at home. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony, we'll open the mic at the end so you can talk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, lastly, I'll just mention the Beekeeper Tech Team. This is a program through Cornell that um, agri markets help provide funding for. Um, so the New York tech team with beekeepers across the state and they um, do inspections, they help beekeepers uh, to evaluate um, their work program where they help evaluate things like budget and growing your business. Um, I will be working with the tech, tech team going forward but if you'd like to check out some of the work and reports that they've done they do an annual report a year and a, a great way to learn a little bit more about the industry in new york and, and some of the main problems that um that we see or um some of the the opportunities for the beating industry as well and then lastly, um, please do register your hives with us. Um, it helps us to inform beekeepers of any honeybee health issues in the state. Uh, with those AFB detections in the two counties this year that you saw, the uh, beekeepers that are on our registration list get an email from us uh, to inform them of the findings. And we let folks know that this has happened so that um, you can be aware and uh, more vigilant, perhaps, and uh, just really to, to help be informed. And this is written in the law that the, the state registration is free to beekeepers, and its purpose is to help inform beekeepers of disease issues or honeybee health issues in the state. It's also a great way for us to communicate the amount of beekeepers we have here and then communicate the need for research in the industry, which is um, which helps the, the industry as a whole grow and move ahead. I, yes, I can answer questions about the registration. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the change in the laws relative to agroponics or chemicals that were previously Agriculture. I I think you're uh, referencing the birds and the bees yeah. act. Oh, yes. Okay. Yep. Um, yes. It's a fitting name. So the um, let's see. Should know there there is an act that was in, uh, put in place to decrease certain or ban certain neonicotinoid chemicals that are used for seed treatments. It's not something effective immediately. Uh, it's something that's going to be phased in. I can follow up with Marianne with a little bit more information on it if you're curious about it. Um, is there something in particular? Well, you know, we're always concerned that you're near uh, a farm that farms particular mm -hmm. sprays quite heavily, especially for GMO uh, crops that are, and they're very chemical dependent, all of these particular chemicals are affecting our bees. So our bees are migrating to different yeah. crops. Yeah. So we're all looking for ways to essentially abate a lot of this chemical influence mm -hmm. in our hives. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a concern and something that the, the birds and the bees act in, um, is trying to address. So I brought this up because I, I was next to a easement, and in that easement, they next to the power authority. They kept me a pre-fed easement with glyphosate. Glyphosate is going to be very, very 
harmful to bees. It also mm -hmm. could be blindness and the coordination uh, amongst other disorders. And so I kept asking the New York State Department of Power. And they refused to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that would be I can um I'll take your information. We can we can talk a little bit about <laughs> um this. I don't have anything specific to add. It's a it's a really big topic. <laughs> so yes, we can we can chat um after and I'll be happy to try to, to get more information um to you for that. You know? And uh, um, just to oh, another question. Oh, yeah, about the registration. I was yes. having a conversation with somebody the other day. You said you need to re register everything. Is that to be true? The registration is meant to be annual. So we do have to re register every year. It's, okay. it's a, something that was written into law, and the process of the registration has to get fine tuned. Right now, we're working um, to get a developer to to be able to improve that registration process so that there are things like a reminder email when your registration um, is changed. If you have major changes in your EPA, please do um, re-register to reflect that. But the registration is supposed to be annual. So if we don't re register, we're not going to get notified of the uh, American Foundation or a. I still have your information. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll be notified. You can't help it. It will. <laughs> we'll still have it. <laughs> as long as your email doesn't change. <laughs> yes. Who has to register? Who, who, the person who has one hive in the backyard or yes. hives, or yep. everybody or just yes. some of us? Yes, yes, you, you have to register the number of colonies that you have and the county in which they're placed. Is it mandatory? Yes, yes. They're gonna come it's mandatory they registration. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yep. Well, I'm glad I mentioned it. <laughs> um, it's it's a pretty simple process. And like I said, it's free. It's meant to, to help inform beekeepers of, of issues in the, in the industry. There was a time in the past when, <clears throat> when the bee inspectors would come around to be through a bee and inspect the hive. Is that process still in effect? We do have the focus is American fowl brood. So unless there's really, you can request a general rec, uh, inspection, but most of the time are, uh, as you saw Matt, we've got four inspectors for the whole state wow. and myself. So they're uh, doing a lot of inspections and AFB is the, the primary concern there. Um, that if you do not want an inspection, that you can't decline. Um, it's it's not it's I think as I, I had on one of the slides up there, if you're selling noobs. It's it's a it's not giving you very much information. Well, <laughs> and, is there anybody you know that doesn't have mites? There are. There might be some people that claim that, but 
it's when you have to treat and how often you have to treat that that sampling is is going to inform you of. Um, so hopefully, have you learned a, like one or two things today for those those few people that are <laughs> that are treating? Yes, we all have mites, um, but so but when no they thing. appear, yeah. There's no such thing as a mite free. So the first year. Yeah, the, the first year, maybe the second year, um, more experienced beekeepers may try to work on developing resistant stock that have more hygienic behavior for cleaning out um, eBay infested by mites, but they're, they're widespread. Um, We'll likely have them, but again, the, the best way to deal with them is by monitoring and seeing how many you have when the population is high enough to have to treat. Yeah, it's not it's not recommended to treat that way. Okay. And I'm happy to answer any more questions that folks have. Um, just remember to try to lean on one another, look for trustworthy resources for all of this type of information. I always try to lean on my um, extension resources, so things from resources from MSU, Penn State, Cornell. Those uh, climates are somewhat similar to ours, so they'll have um, good beekeeping recommendations for you that are similar to our climate. Um, and please have fun as well <laughs> while following all of the recommendations for pest management and disease control. <laughs> yeah. I have a comment, and this is really a plug for your group. Um, when I was less inexperienced than I am now, and sometimes I think I'm getting stupid or all. Uh -huh. But um, welcome to beekeeping. I had a, I had a, a concern about foul brewing in this place, but I called uh, Ryan, and Ryan was very responsive. He helped educate me. He did an inspection, and and it was a Great experience, and he was very responsive. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's really good to hear. Yes. Thank you so much. You'll have to let him know. <laughs> I will or, let Ryan or know. Or maybe not. Ryan? <laughs> Get a big I'll let him know. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, did else yeah, I, I also want to praise Ryan. I moved from a backyard beekeeper to be a commercial beekeeper in the last few years, and I'll have to say, Ryan has been very, very helpful in helping me to essentially get through the uh, details of what's really needed in order to be successful. and make sure that my pest management is under control. I highly recommend anybody to essentially have Ryan just to come by and inspect your hives. Not necessarily the inspection, but just having his knowledge and his key experience with thousands and thousands of hives every year is very helpful. Yeah. Yes. So I praise him. Thank you, yes. <laughs> He sees a lot of colonies yeah. every year. So we're putting a lot of miles on the road. And I have cards here if anyone would like to take one. Um, uh, the last thing I'll say uh, about the regional inspectors, they're, it's very hard for us to keep the phone numbers for them the same each year. And I'm so sorry, but it's really hard. Um, the state tries to save money and they'll turn off numbers that are not active. So that's why we often get new phone numbers for seasonal inspection staff, but it's something I would love to work on. I don't know if I can accomplish, but I would love to make sure they have the same numbers every year. If you are not sure how to get in touch with one of the regional inspectors, please just contact me and I'll happily connect you with them. But that's the last thing I wanted to say <laughs> about the phone numbers. <laughs> Thank you. So oh, Bill? In the beginning of your presentation, you had a number up there that said you had uh, 60,000 hives in New York State. And then I saw at the end you had so 73,000 hives registered. 
Yes. Well, oh, those are, that's our most recent. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. that's our most recent. Our registration. The the last number there. I'm updating it every month, looking at the the regis num registration numbers there. So yes, seventy thousand yeah. ground and registration numbers considerably in the last year. So over sixty thousand. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody at home have any questions? Anthony, do you want to unmute and hello to Annie? Yes, not. Hi, Annie. Went, uh, very, uh, hang on. Very good meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to check out here. Uh, you know, I'll... Whoops, watch your coffee. I stop. I'm going to 